you a little bit about this first year of data that we have from this project where we're supplementing um, pumpkin fields with either honeybees or bumblebees, and then we also have some control fields as well. Um, first off, we're focusing on pumpkins because New York State is consistently ranked in the top five pumpkin producing states. Um, so we wanted to use this as a model crop. We could have chosen any cucurbit, but we chose pumpkin. It also has a huge economic value, an average of $27.3 million um, over a period of five years, four or five years. And it's grown on many farms, which allows us to do our research on, in growers' fields. Um, and it's, as we've been talking about some today, um, it's pollination is required for fruit set. So um, whenever you see a pumpkin, it's, it's had the helping hand of a, a bee. Oops, wrong Not to mention that pumpkins are an essential component of <laughs> Halloween, right? So we have to have a pumpkin on Halloween. Just to give you a little bit of background about the biology of uh, pumpkin flowers, we've also heard a couple of talks about pumpkin flower or cucurbit flowers in general, but the, um, the male and the female flowers are separate on pumpkin plants, but they're, they're both on the same plant, and which is called a monoecious plant. Um, typically, the, the range in pumpkins that we see, um, the, the ratio of male to female flowers is one, one to nine. That's female to male flowers. Much fewer females than there are male flowers. This year, we saw a ratio of one to 30. Many more males than there were females, um, particularly due to the hot temperatures we had and, and dry, and dry um, environments. The flowers only last one day. Uh, they open at dawn and close by late morning, um, early afternoon. So those bees have to get out there and, and get really busy early in the morning, as do the researchers. We know that pumpkin, uh, we know that pollen is required for pollination, but we also did a small study on the research farms at Cornell this year to um, ask whether or not we can maximize yield by adding more pollen. So um, in the right-hand column, are fruit that were left open pollinated. And this is in a non-supplemented field. So we didn't add any bees to this field. These are just wild bees pollinating these fruit. Um, so in the right-hand column are the open pollinated plants that we just left to the devices of the bees there. On the left-hand um, column are fruit that was developed um, by my hand. I took pollen and I added copious amounts to the female flowers, and I got larger fruit. So we now know that we can, we can get larger fruit by adding more pollen. Um, which was essential to know, and then and now we're interested in whether or not supplementing with these also creates the same effect. Okay, so the, the bees that are mainly doing um, the pollination, this work um, has been done in my lab, um, not by me, but by other, other postdocs in the lab. 99% of the um, pollinators to pumpkin are these three species. Honeybees, as probably most of you are aware, um, are a huge player in this system. It's introduced social species. It's a most commonly managed bee species around. They're generalist pollinators, meaning they'll, they'll pollinate a variety of um, crops and plants. But their foraging ability is deterred by cool weather and cloudy weather. They also are prone to disease, as many of you uh, likely know as well, and pests. The squash bee is a, a native bee. It's a solitary bee, lives uh, in the ground, um, bare soil, and it's a cucurbit specialist, so they, they only visit cucurbit plants, including pumpkin. And the common eastern bumblebee um, is perhaps the most interesting player in, in, that we're interested in. It's a native social bee. It's also a generalist pollinator, much like the honeybee, um, but, it, but in this case it's a native species. It nests in either some kind of burrow, abandoned burrow, or a cavity in a fallen tree, um, and unlike honeybees, these bumblebees are active at low temperatures <coughs> and on cloudy days. So we were interested in, in looking at the bumblebee, particularly because honeybee populations are declining in the U.S. They've been declining for some time. Um, this big spike around 1985 that you can see is the, um, the varroa mite um, introduction. And especially um, the times beyond this graph, is when colony collapse disorder has really been causing problems. So in, in case you're unaware, the colony collapse disorder is a phenomenon by which bees abruptly leave the hive and never return. 
Um, beekeepers in 2006 sounded the alarm and started noticing this phenomenon, and it's since been turned uh, colony collapse disorder, mass disappearance of, of bees. Still somewhat unknown what's going on with colony collapse disorder, what's causing it, and there's certainly not a solution, but it's likely due to a variety of factors, not one single factor. Um, those factors might include pesticide exposure, parasitic mites, um, viruses and stress from being moved. Oftentimes, um, these large beekeeping organizations move their bees all around the country um, from one crop to another, and that, that can certainly cause stress on the little bees. So we were really interested in finding an alternative. What, what else is out there that might be managed and might be available for cucurbit producers? From previous research in our lab, we know that bumblebees are really efficient pollinators. They're big, and they, if you watch them, they go into the female flowers, and they just buzz around, and they do a really good job of pollinating. They deposit three times more pollen than honeybees. Um, they also co contact the stigma, which is that female part of the flower, uh, more often than honeybees. The honeybees tend to just walk down the female flower and sit there and sip the nectar, instead of buzzing in there and getting the nectar and um, making everybody else leave, which is what the, the bumblebees do. There's also fewer visits to flowers required for pollination by bumblebees than honeybees or squash bees. Um, and like I said before, bumblebees are an attractive pollinator because they're active on cool, cloudy days. Uh, and they're, they're available commercially. Uh, I know that there are people that, that have been successful in um, rearing them themselves, but they're much more difficult than honeybees. But they're available from Covert Biological Systems and BioVest. And Covert is the company that um, gave us the, the bees for this project. So the objectives were to evaluate yield differences in pumpkins between fields supplemented with bumblebees, honeybees, and a control field where we didn't supplement any bees. There's certainly wild bees there, but we didn't put them there. And then we wanted to compare differences in the bee visits to flowers in these supplemented fields connect that with the yield. Um, lastly, we wanted to do a cost-benefit analysis, which I'll show you the results of um, in, with regards to supplementing with bees, including the cost um, of the bees. So these are our three treatments, the bumblebees, and as you can see, the bumblebees are put out into fields under these um, pallet structures, which is a lot of work. <laughs> um, and then honeybees, um, oftentimes people rent them. We rented them from local beekeepers and then um, the control fields. We conducted these um, studies in commercial pumpkin fields in the Finger Lakes region in 2011 and we chose a variety of field sizes ranging from about one acre to over 25 acres and grouped them into sizes uh, into three categories and then randomly assigned the different treatments, the bumblebee fields, the honeybee fields, and the control fields. We ended up with a total of 24 fields after we had to eliminate some fields because they were too close to um, other managed hives. We stocked the fields then at a density um, for the bumblebees of one quad per two acres. So the bumblebees, when you buy them from Covert, come in these boxes and they're called a quad and they have four colonies in them that are separate from each other. And um, then the stocking density of honeybees was one honeybee hive per three acres. And these are just the recommended stocking densities. Um, the uh, stocking density of bumblebees came from Covert, but um, they don't necessarily have any research to back this stocking density up, which we're really excited to try to do that, and I'll, I'll explain a little bit more about that later. Um, and then the honeybee stocking density is just generally what the growers in our region tend to be using. We used a gladiator variety, which is a, um, a jack o' lantern pumpkin. We planted these in three locations within each field. We recorded bee visits three times during the blooming season, and then we uh, harvested the marketable fruit and weighed it. So this is an example of one of our pumpkin fields, um, just north of Geneva. The outline of the blue is the pumpkin field, and then the three orange lines are the three different areas in the field where we planted 10 plants each for a total of 30 plants. Um, we had water them, Quite a bit, and it was a lot of work, but we 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 did it. So then, at the end of the year, we finally got some yield data uh, from these three different treatments. 
So on the x-axis here is treatment, so some will be supplemented fields, the honeybee supplemented fields, and the non-supplemented fields. And then we've got fruit weight per plant in pounds on the y-axis. We didn't see any significant differences, statistically significant differences in um, yield between these three treatments, but there's certainly a trend toward increasing yield in the bumblebee supplemented fields. Um, likewise, we didn't see any differences in bee visits, bumblebee visits specifically in this graph. So um, across the x-axis again is treatment with bumblebee supplemented fields and non-supplemented fields. And on the y-axis is the bumblebee visits per 100 flowers in the fields. And this is summed over the three visits that we took. Um, so as you can see, there's no differences between um, bumblebee supplemented fields and non-supplemented fields in terms of the bee visits. So this again is suggesting to us that perhaps we're not adding enough bees. This was also a really low bumblebee um, year in terms of the wild bees as well. Only 1.5 bees per 100 flowers is really, really low. Um, we had also no statistical significant differences in honeybee supplemented fields versus non-supplemented fields in terms of honeybee visits. Um, and again, these are the same axes with honeybee visits per 100 flowers on the y-axis. So lastly, we wanted to extrapolate these yield values that we got to a cost per acre um, so that growers could know whether or not adding bees is going to be cost effective. The parameters we used for estimating the crop value include the average number of fruit per plant um, and marketable fruit weight per plant uh, from each of the fields separately. We also assumed an average row spacing of six feet and within row spacing of three feet, which is what we used um, and we noticed most growers were using as well. Then we, um, we wanted to investigate two different prices received just to get a, a range. We used 24 cents per pound, um, which is the average of five years that we got from the National Agricultural Statistics Service. And then in 2011, growers told us on average they were receiving about 39 cents per pound for jack and pumpkins. Then we subtracted from this value the cost of supplementing with bees. Um, the cost of supplementing for, with honeybees, this is what it cost us to, to rent the bees with $85 per hive, rounds out to $28.33 per acre. And then the cost of bumblebees is really high. It's um, $220 per quad, um, so that's $110 per acre. But given those high costs, we think it's still cost effective. Um, so here we have the three different treatments, bumblebee supplemented fields, honeybee supplemented fields, and control fields. And then these, again, are just the weights from the um, previous slide of the fruit weight per plant in pounds. And then we have our two different prices received, the 24 cents per pound and 39 cents per pound. And then just the value gained from, by supplementing. So how much more per acre can you gain by supplementing with fields? And these are all, all these values are adjusted for the cost of um, supplementing with bees. So as you can see, supplementing with bumblebees on average um, might earn you $972 to $1,600. $50 per, pound, uh, per acre more than if you didn't supplement with bumblebees. And although this is only one year of data and um, the, the, these yield differences were not statistically significant, there's still a, a, a potential chance for um, yield increase with, the, with supplementing with bumblebees. So again, in conclusion, we didn't see any significant differences in uh, pumpkin yield or bee visits to flowers uh, and the crop values were similar between fields supplemented with bumblebees, honeybees, and those that weren't supplemented. But again, we did see this trend and we're interested in investigating this further. This is just one year of data where it hoped we're planning on doing this another year and possibly a third year. Um, and we have other things going on in the lab as well with this same project. We're interested in whether or not um, resources in the landscape might affect the wild bees. So whether or not um, other perhaps flowering crops earlier or during the same time as pumpkin blooming might either negatively or positively affect the bumblebees, or bumblebees and honeybees and squash bees for that matter, um, in the pumpkin field. So we're digitizing landscapes um, using ArcGIS, uh, a pretty powerful program to try to better understand how the landscape might impact wild bees. Um, we're also looking at field size 
and um, cropping practices such as history of cucurbit production um, on the land and in the, the general vicinity. Squash bees are certainly more um, abundant when there's a longer history of cucurbit production. Um, and, and again, we, we're really interested in looking at this um, bee density question, because, given that we didn't see statistical significant differences in bee visits in fields that were supplemented with bumblebees. We had a host of um, undergraduates that helped us this summer um, weighing bees and counting bees and putting bees in fields. Um, we also had a, a ton of pumpkin growers that helped us and this work wouldn't have been possible without them. Uh, as I said, we got the bumblebees from covert biological systems and support came from the New York Ag and Market Specialty Crop Farm block grant. Happy to take any questions. <laughs> yeah. Good question. No. Uh, yep, I will. Uh, so the question was what happens with the bumblebees? Basically, what's the biology of bumblebees as compared to honeybees? So, honeybees overwinter, the whole colony overwinters, whereas bumblebees, the whole colony dies. And um, at the end, near the end of the season, uh, the, the queen produces new queens for next year and males, and they mate. And then the new queens um, find a place to hang out for the winter and then they have to produce their own new colony de novo every single year. Um, so when you buy bees from Cooper, no, they're, they're done. They last one year, and you have to burn them. So it would it make more cost effective to get honeybees longer than bumblebees? Right. If you, so, so I also <coughs> mentioned that um, the question was whether or not it would be more cost effective long term if you're going to be able to produce your own bees, whether or not it would be more cost effective to get honeybees. Um, perhaps, yeah, perhaps uh, that's something that, that maybe we should consider into our um, economics. Most of the growers we work with, don't, they rent. Um, but you, as I suggested at one point, it is possible to, um, to rear bumblebees as well, but it's harder. <laughs> yeah. Um, it's actually followed very directly on that question, and my question is, when you estimate your price for bumblebees, one, did you include shipping? Mm, and, no. Which could be almost as right. much or more than the cost of bumblebees. The question was, did we include shipping? Yeah. And yeah. two, did you replace your bumblebee hive every five weeks, or did you just use one all season? So the question was whether or not we replaced the hive every um, five weeks. We just used one all season. Um, they, we monitored them. They were relatively strong, and, and they were relatively strong um, to begin with as well. Uh, Covert suggests that there's about 200 um, workers per um, per colony, so times four for one quad. But yeah, you're right. Shipping costs are astronomical. I think for the 60 quads that we ordered for next year, the shipping is $2,500. Yeah, so the question is whether or not to plant um, beneficial flowers to attract the bees. This is the other thing that we've considered and we just haven't figured out how to logistically do it, is to attract bees, uh, perhaps from surrounding areas. Um, one, we haven't figured out what to plant in terms of attracting them um, or keeping them in the field instead of perhaps they're leaving the field. Perhaps the bees we put out there don't go to pumpkin. So one of the other things that we're interested in doing is um, grabbing some of the bees, returning to the hives, both bumblebee and honeybee hives, and looking at their pollen to see whether or not it's pumpkin. Does that answer your question? We um, have uh, a lot of squash and pumpkin fields and also apple orchards around them. And so we have bees, honeybees in the apple orchard that, that we raise ourselves. In the last two years, the bumblebees have chased off the honeybees out of the Patches. And there's just this amazing number of bumblebees which we never saw before. 
and we don't know, well, I mean, it's so striking that this happened so quickly, but we don't have any idea what to do. Yeah, that's interesting. So the question is why there might be more bumblebees in the past than there, than there were, um, or now that compared to in the past. Um, offhand, I can't think of a reason. Um, I know we have done a lot of behavioral studies and they do tend to chase them off. Um, but no, I, I can't I can't think of what might 